Hey, good afternoon. Guess what time it is? It is four o'clock in the mountain time, which means six o'clock on the East Coast and three on the West. Tuesday afternoons means it's time for Fertility with Fink and Friends. I am Fink, you are friends, and it is great to be with you. After a nice week off I had uh, last week with uh, uh, spring break, and uh, if you had a little spring break in your life, I hope that was a wonderful experience for you as well. It's good to get away, you know, it absolutely really is. Uh, but you know what? I missed you guys. Honestly, I did. Um, I, I really thought about, well, maybe I can, you know, throw a Fink and Friends on, uh, you know, on Tuesday afternoon. Just you know, maybe somebody will want to see it. So um, I did. I, I missed you. It's actually really fun to be with uh, such a wonderful, uh, great group of people here. Uh, really a supportive and beautiful group um, to each other, to me, uh, to the whole process. And so really very wonderful thing. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Let's see who we have. So we've got uh, we've got CNY's Instagram here. We've got uh, Facebook and uh, LinkedIn and YouTube right here in the middle. We've got my Instagram over here. Nice to see everybody. Let's see who was our first to join. Oh, my dear friend, Angela. Um, nice to see you this fine day. Welcome to Colorado. I understand that you will be having a uh, an embryo transfer in the imminent future, and that makes us all very happy. Hello to Amanda Pants. Nice to see you here today. Uh, let's see, uh, Danny and Cicely and um, and uh, M. Galaviz. Uh, we'll get to your questions here in just a second. But first, over here on the CNY side, Crystal and Crystal eighty four, and to be precise, uh, Kimber Ray, um, Illumina, uh, Mitch Marks, Leroy. Good to see you, Lindsay, Liz, Carmen, V. Slam, uh, uh, Rich, uh, Patty Cologne. Um, uh, Ash is here. Gosh, what a good group of folks. And over here on the uh, Facebook side, it looks like um, we've got uh, Julie and Jessica. Uh, Jessica says, no questions. Just uh, got to Colorado Springs and have my egg retrieval tomorrow at 830 in the morning. Jessica, we are looking forward to having you. Boy, that is good news. And it's beautiful weather here in Colorado. So uh, we had a little snow here and there. We got a kind of a big dumping on, but but uh, fortunately, uh, nothing uh, so terrible like some of the rest of the country has been uh, been having here um, for sure. I, I have a couple of things that I want to talk to you about uh, today that I just kind of want to plant in, in your brains. But there was a first question over here that came from uh, M. Galavis, and I wanted to uh, answer it. Uh, nine days uh, post day five transfer, beta was 32. Should I guard my heart? Um, stats don't look good. So, um, you know, normally after a day five transfer, we would be doing that first beta, uh, typically on day 10. So the fact that yours was a 32 on day nine, I think is actually pretty good. So, um, should you be guarding your heart to be honest with you in this, you know, with what we do here, we always have to be guarding our heart. Um, so uh, hopefully the answer is, boy, that is a good thing you got going on there. Fingers crossed. Um, so I don't think there's anything in particular about <clears throat> those stats that sound like it's a problem. So um, that's that's very good news. Lady Jamelis is going into Sarasota next week for an FET. What about what are your thoughts about a uh, frozen embryo transfer of a day three embryo? There's nothing in the world wrong with a day three embryo. So there are many clinics that will not transfer day three embryos. Why not? Because they're really looking to show that they have this astronomically high uh, pregnancy rate and they don't want to do anything that might have a possibility of not being successful. Certainly, if you have an embryo that grows to blast, it has a higher probability of being able to get you a baby. But if we're limited in the numbers, we will tell you all day, want you to freeze that embryo at day three, because I would much rather see that embryo going back into you than potentially dying in the lab. You are a much better thing than anything that we have in the laboratory as it comes to growing embryos. So I would say, you know, a day three embryo is a is a good thing, a good thing, and I think you should absolutely, positively, uh, um, uh, feel optimistic about that. Hundred percent, hundred percent. 
You know, before we uh, get into the meat and potatoes here and talk about uh, all your questions, there's some kind of new information, and uh, and uh, and, I, and I wanted to share it particularly for people who have had recurrent miscarriages or who, uh, who have had a number of embryo transfers and who have not gotten pregnant. So there is an entity that we know of as recurrent implantation failure. And technically what that means is three or more, typically three or more good quality embryos that should have gotten you pregnant, but didn't. So that may be two euploid embryos that didn't get you pregnant plus an untested. Maybe it's a donor embryo. Maybe it's three blasts of your own. Um, there is, uh, so there was a recent study that came out um, that I, I will tell you, um, I've started using uh, pretty extensively, even uh, since I read it uh, just last week. Um, but everybody at CNY doesn't know about it yet. So it may be something that if this pertains to you that you have to ask for specifically um, uh, until I've really had a chance to be able to, uh, to educate everybody about it. And, and it goes a little something like this. It's using the medication that we know of as Prograf. And Prograf or Tacrolimus is a medicine that is already on our level three immune protocol. So it's not a foreign drug to us. Basically, uh, Prograf is a medication that's used uh, uh, for folks who have had embryo or uh, rather um, um, organ transplants. And the study arose out of the fact that they looked at um, um, a number of women uh, who have had kidney transplants and young people can end up with kidney transplants um, who have then gotten pregnant. But because of all that medication, all that uh, uh, medication for, uh, you know, transplant stuff, and, and maybe they're not the healthiest folks to begin with, there is an expectation that they might not have super positive outcomes with pregnancy. Well, they looked and they found that the people who, uh, those women who were on uh, Prograf had astonishingly good results with their pregnancies. So now we have, as I said, always had Prograf as one of the uh, medications on immune protocol level three. Um, what this study did is that it took specifically the women who had had recurrent implantation failure and then started testing them. The way this medication works is that there are two forms of what are known as T helper cells in the body. T cells are immune modulating cells. There's a type one and a type two. The type one cell, the type one T helper cell, is the one that goes to a place in your body and sounds the alarms. You know, the bells are ringing, the lights are flashing, it's going, wah, stimulate an immune response here. Well, that's kind of what's happening at the level of the uterus, specifically the part that's called the decidua, where the embryo is starting to implant. Type one cells recognize that embryo implanting as an invader. Type two cells are the ones that come and say, okay, 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 cool it, cool it, everything is okay, chill out, and results in some more kind of longer term immunity, but less of that real acute immune response. So what they've discovered is that much like women who have had organ transplants, people with recurrent pregnancy loss and with recurrent implantation failure have a an uneven ratio of that type one cell to the type two cell. They have too many type one cells. So there's too much alarm going and not enough cool it. So they studied a bunch of different doses and what they found was uh, a dose of 1.5 milligrams twice a day. So that's a one milligram capsule and a 0.5 milligram capsule, because unfortunately that's the way it is. They don't make it in a 1.5. So you got to get the one milligram uh, bottle and you got to get the 0 0.5 milligram bottle. And you take one of each twice a day for a total of three milligrams daily had a truly like earth shatteringly dramatic effect on improving the pregnancy outcomes for these patients. Now in the study, they were looking at euploid embryos or embryos that had all already been tested that were chromosomally normal. So those in general give us our highest probability of pregnancy. Each one of those has about a 65% chance of pregnancy. That's the highest odds we could hope for with IVF. 
So um, we, uh, we would say that, okay, in that group, well, basically what happened is that their control group had about a 30 to 40% success rate of transfer. And remember, it should have been 65. It increased that success rate to 93%, which is astonishing. I mean, that's really huge news. Um, typically in our protocols, we use 0.5 twice a day because it just seemed like the right thing to do. Now I know, and I will communicate this to my colleagues at CNY, I want you to know that if you are in that scenario, recurrent implantation failure or recurrent pregnancy loss, um, 1.5 milligrams of prograph or tacrolimus twice a day, usually starting from the day of your progesterone start, continuing through, well, it just kind of depends when to continue it through, it just depends on, on kind of what your history is. So if you've had first, first trimester miscarriages, we'd probably continue that through uh, 12 weeks. If you have had, uh, you know, second trimester loss at, at you know, 16, 17 weeks, uh, I would continue it through 20 weeks. It's also been shown um, to significantly decrease some of the severe complications that can arise in pregnancy. So this is really huge news. Um, this is, this is good stuff here. And so I wanted to share it. I was going to put an Instagram post up about it, but uh, until I really have a chance to educate everybody at CNY, uh, uh, some have read the study, but uh, for all of our providers, uh, just to make sure that everybody knows what it is so that uh, uh, you don't call and ask about it. And they say, I don't know anything about that. Um, um, it's a pretty benign drug. It's, it is very safe in pregnancy. It's been on our immune protocol, uh, but 1.5 milligrams twice a day from the time of progesterone start. So there's Fink's tidbit of the day. And I hope that proves helpful. I'm actually very excited about it because there are a number of people uh, I know personally uh, who will really benefit from that. And so I can't wait to see. Now, if you don't have a euploid embryo, I would not expect the results to be as high because with the euploid embryo, in theory, you're taking out some of the embryo issues that result in embryos not being able to continue to grow. But I think it's a great intervention. And uh, as I say, super excited about it. So let's see what else we got here. Now let's get into some questions. Uh, Mariah says, is an eight millimeter lining too thick for at a baseline for an FET? We like it to be a little bit less. We like it to be at about six or less, five to six or less. So that would make me wonder, well, have you had the cavity evaluated? Do we know for sure that you don't have a polyp? Is, are you really on the way to still kind of sloughing off and cleaning it out? If I saw it was an eight, I might look at it again in a couple of days and just see. It's not totally a deal breaker, but again, we like to see it a little bit thinner uh, than that. Lots of folks joining over here on the uh, CNY side. Ash says, getting started with Colorado Springs for my first round of IVF. Yeah. Yay, I hit my med bundle. Is it common or possible to change out the PIO shots for progesterone suppositories? Okay, so Ash, you ask a very good question. If you are going to do, so, <clears throat> you know, what happens, <coughs> excuse me, in the med bundles, is that you are getting um, both your retrieval meds and you're getting meds that are appropriate for a, um, a medicated cycle FET or a medicated cycle embryo transfer. Um, if you're doing a fresh transfer, those are always medicated cycles. Um, if you're doing a frozen embryo transfer, you can do it as a natural cycle. In the medicated cycle, the progesterone and oil is really necessary. The outcomes of using vaginal progesterone only in a medicated cycle embryo transfer are abysmal. They are low enough that I would tell you, you are really wasting an embryo. I would not at all recommend it. However, if you're doing a frozen embryo transfer with a natural or a modified natural cycle, then 100%. You don't use the progesterone and oil, you use uh, vaginal progesterone. So um, please don't do a medicated cycle and say, I don't want to use that PIO. I want to use vaginal progesterone only because odds are you're not going to be getting pregnant and you're going to be wasting an embryo. Um, 
but you can do it with a, with a natural or a modified natural cycle. You don't use the PIO at all, which is one of the also more exciting things that has really become more popular in the last, oh, I'd say year, year and a half, um, because it's saving so many people's butts from big, thick injections of progesterone and oil for 10 weeks. And so I kind of feel like if you can avoid doing that, probably not a bad idea. The natural transfer cycle is said to at least be as effective as a medicated cycle, but there are some studies that show it may even be more effective, that it has a little higher pregnancy rate, it has a little lower miscarriage rate, and it has a little lower, certainly a, a lower risk of, of some uh, uh, blood, pl blood pressure related complications uh, in pregnancy. So if you ask me, I'm almost always gonna tell you, hey, let's do a, a, a natural or modified natural. I think that's a better way to go. If you've done medicated before and it worked and it got you pregnant, eh, it's hard to say change over to something else. but um, that right there is my two cents worth, Ash. Um, be kind, be love. I like the name. Nice to see you. Emily Wynn says, how soon after con consultation, if we pay up, oh, if we pay up front, <laughs> if we pay up, um, how soon after consultation can we start treatment? So usually <clears throat> after you have had your initial consultation, um, our team will be in touch with you within about a week or so. Um, has to go through finance. <clears throat> you have to get your medications in hand. Plan has to be your, your uh, monitoring business has to be set up. But theoretically, depending on when you do it. So that first month is usually considered the, uh, <coughs> pardon me, the diagnostic month. Um, but you can do uh, start your IVF uh, the very next month. Excuse me. Mm. I'm all choked up, Emily. You see what's happened? Gosh, it's a very emotional question. Um, yeah, you can start your IVF in the very uh, very next month. Now, if you're two days before your period is going to start, um, it is unlikely that that's going to work out. Timing-wise, it's probably going to be a month later. So figure probably that very next month. Um, a law asks, is, is a mini IVF good for diminished ovarian reserve? <clears throat> I think that is the best use of a mini dose. <clears throat> for people with a diminished ovarian reserve. And so let's just talk about that so we're all on the same page. And that is <clears throat> that in the olden days, if you had a lower ovarian reserve, which is measured through the hormone known as an AMH, the anti-Mullerian hormone, um, we would say, well, we want to pour as much medication on those ovaries as we can to try to get you to respond. Um, higher dose must be a better thing. Well, what we've learned is that those higher doses um, actually really aren't a better thing. As you get higher, you start to get kind of diminishing returns. So based on the data that came out of really out of Europe, because in Europe, the governments cover the IVF. And the government says, we don't care if you get 20 eggs or you get two eggs, we're paying for this. So everybody is going to get a low dose of medication. So what we learned from this mini dose thing is that, and mini dose is kind of a generic term. There's not one specific dose that's called, or that is associated with, with mini dose. It can mean different things to different, to different people, but the, uh, the low dose uh, protocols give you the same kind of outcomes ultimately as you would get with the high dose protocols. So let's say with a high dose protocol, maybe you get six follicles. Of those six follicles, you get uh, uh, four eggs, two of them fertilize. Well, with a mini dose, you're not going to get all six follicles. You might get four follicles, and of those four follicles, two, two of them fertilize. So you kind of end up getting the same result as you would expect <clears throat> from the higher dose therapy, but at a much lower exposure to medication um, and at a lower incidence of side effects. Now, I don't think mini dose is appropriate for people with a normal ovarian reserve because is it appropriate? I mean, yeah, you can use it, but the goal is we want to maximize the number of eggs so that we can maximize the number of embryos in order to maximize your options. You know, um, let's take a look over on the Facebook side. Got a lot of folks over here. Thanks for your patience. Uh, Julie says, uh, I'm 46 years old, trying for our first child, had my initial consult last November. Life got in the way. 
Uh, but now I'm able to start the egg retrieval process at Colorado Springs. But my cycles have suddenly changed since my consult four months ago. I've gone from a steady average of 26 uh, days uh, prior to the consult to now 15 to 22 days and an LH surge starting on day five or six. I'm concerned that perimenopause is setting in. And, you know, you're right, uh, Julie. And at 46, it's a it's truly an uphill battle. If you had your consultation in November, um, um, the dose that we put in place um, is still good. Um, so what happens in those situations? Well, it's more an issue of, well, gosh, what's your ovarian reserve and how are your ovaries going to respond to the medication? So that's what I'd be concerned about. Those cycle irregularities we take out of the equation when we're doing IVF because we're stimulating the follicles, we're growing them, and we're giving you a medication known as the antagonist, and that's the cetratide, the Ganarelix, the Provera, sometimes even Clomid, um, that will prevent you from ovulating. So you're not going to get that LH surge uh, too early, or at least you shouldn't. Some people do break through the medications, but we're giving you medicine to kind of control that, uh, Julie. So, so that part we got. Um, what's in the ovaries and what the egg quality is in the ovaries is a much more important feature. So just a note about egg quality. If you remember from a couple weeks ago, um, I have a new book. Uh, I wrote a little book. It's an ebook, very easy to read ebook um, that talks about what can a handful of vitamins do for human reproduction. What can we do to, um, uh, you know, what vitamins can you take to, to try to get pregnant? Um, that book, it's only seven bucks ebook. It's available uh, at my link tree. Uh, uh, link, which is on my Instagram page at Randy Fink MD, or if you can remember link tree, L I N K T R dot E E slash Randy Fink MD. Uh, you can see, um, access to that. There's actually a discount code in there to get some, uh, supplements, uh, discounted forever more. Uh, but it spells out very clearly what the different protocols are for embryo transfer, for diminished ovarian reserve, for regular fertility. And that's whether you're trying at home, whether you're doing IUIs, whether you're doing IVF and even, uh, a segment on males. Um, um, if you're already taking something that's on the list, don't buy it again. You don't need more supplements. Brands are not what are important, although with the caveat that I will say that CNY's molecular fertility brand is very good. If you're already taking some of the molecular fertility supplements, just check, check the labels against what's on the very clear and easy to read list of what you're supposed to be on and why and make sure that you're getting the right doses. That dose is very important. I also uh, did a, um, a little, uh, an audio book that uh, truthfully I'm, I'm very proud of. I'm working on a couple of video courses. Uh, one is a general fertility course I'm about to finish and the other is uh, going to be kind of your IVF consult where we can answer every question you can imagine uh, will be answered in that course. But of course, we're still, I'm still working on it. So not available yet. However, the ebook on the supplements, it's called the Vitamin Victory, is on my link tree. Also, the uh, the link that's on my Instagram page, Randy Fink MD, um, uh, or link tree slash uh, Randy Fink, MD, and that's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E. -E. So egg quality is probably the most important thing we have to deal with. That really is something that we can affect by using supplements, and that's kind of what the book is about. Uh, Elizabeth uh, is here and says, do you need to get an HSG in order to do IVF? The answer is no. Um, I am not a fan of the... Uh, of the uh, HSG. There are some people who feel like, well, we need to do it so that we can make sure that there is no uh, fluid in the fallopian tube. Uh, ultrasound should be able to diagnose that. HSG is not considered uh, a, an integral part of the evaluation for someone who's going right into IVF. Now, many of our provi providers will order it for you um, just reflexively, or sometimes our global team will send you a requisition that says um, to do an HSG because it's kind of a standard thing. But if you are doing IVF, 
uh, and you talk to me, I won't be ordering you an HSG because we don't need to know about your fallopian tubes. If we're worried about a fluid that's in the fallopian tubes, if it is clinically significant enough to be an issue, we should be able to see that by ultrasound. Um, so there you go. Uh, Liz is saying excited to watch today. I should be coming into Colorado at the end of April for an egg retrieval. Excited and nervous. Which is better, day three or day five embryos? Um, again, you know, the, the issue there, Liz, is that um, if you have enough embryos to be able to grow uh, to blastocyst, which is uh, considered day five, sometimes day six, sometimes day seven, um, these embryos will have a higher probability of being able to get you pregnant. So that's a good thing to do. But if we're limited in the numbers, I'd rather you stop, hold off, let's do something with them, do your transfer or freeze them at day three, because I would much, day three gives you more flexibility. You can always thaw them and grow them later. It is easier and safer for the embryo to do that from day three growing out to day five than it is to thaw at day five and then try to biopsy and refreeze if that makes sense. So day three gives you more flexibility. Day five will give you a greater probability of pregnancy. Uh, let's see here. Um, Chef Blackney says, uh, is stimming for only seven days messing up the embryos, meaning poor quality? Well, you know, it's not messing them up per se, but if I had a choice, I would rather go, if we knew that, you know, if you did a stim and then you did another stim and you were only stimming for seven days, I would say, well, let's lower the dose and slow it down a little bit because the ideal uh, number of stim days is nine to 12. So nine days is, is, is a good thing. Seven is a little short, but it is what it is. So if that's what's happened in this cycle, you were going to make the best of it. But I would say we want to learn something for your next cycle. And that is, I think you should slow it down. Nine days would be better. Uh, Shay Nicole says, uh, hi, Dr. Fink, doing my FET whenever my cycle starts. What do you think about the HCG wash? I do think the HCG wash is a good thing. And basically what we're doing there is usually the day before, uh, one to two days before your transfer, we will, uh, uh, take a little bit of the pregnancy hormone and place it inside the uterine cavity, like a teaspoon of fluid. It's, it's not very much fluid, but that washes around. And what it does is that it turns up some of the receptors on the inside that are associated with um, implantation. What's a receptor? Think of it as like a TV antenna stick, sticking on top of a house. All those little TV antennas are listening for signal and they're listening for a pregnancy signal because that's going to tell that lining to go crazy and do what it's supposed to do. Well, think of it. If we put, if we sprinkle a little of that stuff on the inside, that may be some magic baby dust that wakens up some of that tissue and makes it more likely uh, to, uh, to be successful when the embryo comes along. So yeah, I do think that that's a good thing. Uh, let's see. Um, Jamaica says, how soon after vaginal delivery can you cycle again? I don't recommend that you do it before about nine months. I'd want your baby uh, to be about nine months old um, if possible. Now, if you're just doing an egg retrieval and not planning to try to get pregnant yet, I would say that, um, um, you know, you could do that at six months. I mean, really, honestly, you could do that sooner if you if you truly needed to. Um, but we wouldn't want you to be breastfeeding because that does change things that will, uh, the hormones will mess up the breastfeeding and the breastfeeding will mess up the hormones. So um, Elisha is here and said, he just did my egg retrieval. He's the best. I hope you're talking about this he. You better not be talking about some other he on my show. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. If that was addressed to me, then thank you very much. I um, hi to Nina Buena. Hi to Midwest Roots and Roxy and Coco Fitness. JM Dots, Mrs. Simpson. JM says, hi, Dr. F. Could you please talk about histocompatibility and what all could influence this for better or for worse? Is it possible to be genetically incompatible? And how would you test for that? Well, so in general, um, histocompatibility means it's, it's referring to something um, at the level of your blood cells known as HLA matching. And it has to do with how, how cells will match with each other. And, and there is 
um, a possibility that that um, that uh, that sperm and egg can have compatibility issues, but more likely we think of is there a problem with embryo and mom having compatibility issues. And that's one of the reasons that we um, employ the immune protocols. So um, can it be tested? Yes, it can. It gets very complicated and it gets extremely expensive. Um, most of the time, if someone really needs to test for those histo major histocompatibility in, in uh, incompatibility, major, you know what I mean, that's a mouthful. Uh, if, if, if they're called the major histocompatibility complexes, if someone really needs to be tested for that, I would say, you know, I would see a reproductive immunologist. Um, or if, um, you know, there is a test that's called Pregmune, P-R-E-G-M-U-N-E, -E, uh, which uh, you can order, um, you do a bunch of blood tests and then it's run through their algorithm and gives you about a 65 page or so report um, where you can kind of look at all those autoimmune issues. It requires about, you know, the test itself is expensive and it requires about probably $10,000 in blood tests to do. So it's not something that I would generally recommend. Although what I will tell you is that it's probably cheaper than going to see a reproductive immunologist. Um, the the um, recommendations that come from that test are almost always very, very similar to what comes from the reproductive immunologist. And um, they're really not remarkably different from um, what we do in our own immune protocols. So um, usually that uh, histocompatibility issue is going to be covered by things like nupagen, um, by things like uh, that may be uh, um, affected by low-dose naltrexone, um, and, uh, and certainly there's some what we call graft versus host issues that will be handled by ProGraph. Um, so we generally do treat that. Biggest gun there is to use IVIG, uh, which covers really every kind of, uh, of autoimmune problem we can think of, but it's extremely expensive and not available to everybody because of its cost. So we're happy to help you with that one if you want to talk to us about it. Good question there, JM. Um, hi to Shabnan. Nice to see you. Uh, hey, Erica. Good to see you too. Mrs. Simpson says, so excited to come for IVF soon. If I do genetic testing and an FET, would it have a good chance of taking? Also, can we do more than one embryo? Good question. So, if you do genetic testing on your embryo, and we find that that embryo is chromosomally normal, what that means is that one embryo will give you a 65% probability of pregnancy. By the time you transfer a second embryo, you have an 88% probability of pregnancy. And by the time you transfer your third tested normal embryo, you're at a 95% probability of pregnancy. So it's not a perfect system. It doesn't always work, but um, um, that's uh, the, one of the benefits of genetic testing is that it gives you embryos that have a higher probability of being successful. Um, if you have a large group of embryos, it's great for using that testing to separate out which embryos have the highest probability of being able to get you pregnant right? That's the best use of PGT. That, and if you need to do, um, um, you know, gender selection, you're, you're doing it because you want a particular sex of a baby, male or female, um, um, then you do the PGT testing. That's the only way to do that. Um, so yes, um, an FET uh, with a tested embryo is the highest chance of success in the whole IVF world. So that's a good thing. Can you transfer more than one embryo? We generally recommend that you follow the ASRM guidelines, uh, which are designed with your safety in mind in terms of how many embryos you can or should transfer. Now at CNY, um, we will transfer outside of guidelines for you if you uh, insist and if you want to do that in most cases um, outside of guidelines and against medical advice. There are some situations when we will say no, we will not do that because ultimately, even though it's against guidelines, your safety is our liability. So there are times that sometimes people will want to transfer um, two euploid embryos. There's really not many other places in the country 
uh, fertility clinics that will allow you to transfer to you euploid embryos. It's a bad idea. In most cases, you really shouldn't do it, um, but people want to. And so in most cases, we'll say, okay, as long as, you know, there's not something glaring about the history that's going to make it, you know, even more dangerous than it already is. Like, let's say that you had uh, a 17-week uh, loss of twins before. Well, we're not going to do something that's going to give you a very high chance of having twins. That would just be negligent. Um, there are some people that come in and say, well, I want to transfer three blastocysts. Generally speaking, we will say no, um, because again, that's not a, a safe thing for you. There are exceptions to all these rules. And again, these are the things that we're happy to talk with you about. Um, you can transfer more than one embryo, but I would encourage you to look up online the ASRM guidelines for embryo transfer. ASRM is the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Uh, Erica says, what are the success rates you see for Oralissa in endometriosis patients? So when we know that you have endometriosis um, we and we know that it's affecting the lining of the uterus, the data shows us that suppressing that endometriosis for 60 days before doing your embryo transfer will increase the probability of that transfer being successful to greater than 65%. So Oralissa works really well. I think it's a, a much better choice than Lupron. Lupron is the old way of doing things. You know, for 30 plus years, I think Lupron is all we ever had to be able to treat endometriosis. But Lupron shuts everything down. It's flick, turning off the switch. It's turning the volume dot knob down to nothing. And so you really have no hormones and you feel that. It's not a good feeling to be suppressed with with Lupron, because you've gone from full speed ahead hormones, basically to menopause very quickly. Now it's a temporary menopause. It's not something that's, you know, ongoing forever. It, it goes away when the shot wears off. And the benefit of that is that that's going to help you uh, help your endometriosis. Um, Oralissa is just a little um, more gentle way of doing that. There's another medication as well that's called Myfembri. Myfembri actually even gives you a little hormonal add back, has the same suppressive effect on endometriosis while um, not making you quite so miserable from being uh, free of hormones. Um, let's see, on to the uh, CNY side there. Uh, hi from Delaware. Hello, nice to see you today. Um, Let's see, uh, I can't say the name. Is it Janina Tellado? Sorry, from, from hello. Appointment 422 in Syracuse. Um, they're lucky to have you over there. Um, should I continue taking inositol through pregnancy? And that comes from Amy. Hey, Amy, I would say there's no reason that you have to stop inositol in pregnancy. Inositol is a, uh, is a vitamin. Um, the recommended dosage, by the way, and uh, you can read about this in my fabulous ebook, by, by the by, um, it, dosage is two grams twice a day, 2,000 milligrams uh, twice a day. Inositol um, helps to, to handle our insulin resistance. Um, and so in, um, in early pregnancy, it decreases miscarriage rate. Um, in uh, IVF, it improves uh, egg quality. Uh, in folks with polycystic ovarian syndrome, it can help get them to ovulate. But in pregnancy itself, it also decreases the risk for gestational diabetes. So yeah, I would definitely continue it. Oh, a special hello to Meg Marnell, our operating room director out of Syracuse. Happy to see you here this afternoon. Um, let's see, uh, Miraless uh, says, if I'm taking Omnitrope for priming for two months, uh, will I also take this med while stimming for retrieval? Usually you stop your Omnitrope um, just before retrieval. So, yep, it's a great thing to do to prime, uh, but it also helps during stim as well. So I would encourage you, yeah, to stay on it. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, Allison says, in my day three embryo is three years old now. That is, uh, that, that's the... That is the best thing I've heard all day. So whoever tells you, oh no, there's no, you know, you don't want to do anything with a day three embryo. Oh really? I can introduce you to um, a thousand, uh, 
probably way more than that. 10,000 people with day three embryos that are now their very happy children. Allison, thank you so much for sharing that. That is awesome. Salsa 2014, what are the supplements we should take at age 41? CoQ10, fish oil, daily vitamin, prenatal, vitamin D3, Omnitrope. Can you think of anything else? I feel like I take so much. Yes, there is a whole list of things. And um, that you can see, actually, if you will, uh, um, I am happy to send you just that list through full script. Um, or um, uh, it's in my little ebook uh, where it spells out very clearly. Seven bucks from a link tree, L-A-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Randy. Fink MD. Or if you forget that, look at the name on my Instagram, uh, the link there, it's Randy Fink MD. Um, and that has the whole list, spells it out very clearly. But there are a whole bunch of things at 41, uh, or for folks uh, with diminished ovarian reserve, or for folks who have um, done some things before and have had um, uh, relatively poor outcomes. There's a, a protocol of uh, 10 to 12 different supplements that are all evidence-based in order to try to get you pregnant. So I feel very strongly about, about that. That's why I wrote the book. Um, okay, let's see who else we got going on here. Georgia Sun says, hi to Dr. Fink. Hello, Georgia. Um, uh, Sharmila says, uh, I'm taking 75 uh, micrograms of thyroid medicine to good day. I did my blood work and my result is 0.06. So what should I do? Well, that's a good question. Um, so with the TSH blood test, what we're looking for is a thyroid hormone in the range of, um, of uh, 0 0.5 to 2.5. So the higher the number, like 2.5, the lower the thyroid. So if your thyroid number was 4.0, that's a pretty slow moving or sluggish thyroid. The lower the number, the higher the thyroid. So yours is 0 0.06. That's a little lower of a number than we would want to see, which means your thyroid's volume knob is turned up a little higher than we would like. So usually what we do is just to drop your thyroid down a notch, we go from 75 to 50. That's how we would handle that. Um, Shabnam says, I have a frozen embryo transfer tomorrow. Any suggestions after the transfer? You know, um, people talk about, um, a friend, McDonald's French fries. That's the biggest thing. Everybody says, should I do the French fries? Well, what is the, anybody know the origin of the French fry myth? Um, one, I, in my particular opinion, there's very few, um, there's, um, you don't need an excuse to get McDonald's French fries, in my, in my opinion. But um, we think it probably has something to do with, you know, the sodium, the salt with electrolytes, because maintaining an appropriate electrolyte balance um, is said to be a good thing. But um, um, it is really more of a myth. So after an embryo transfer, usually say two days, I want you to be taking it easy, uh, which just means nothing overly strenuous. You can travel, you can walk up steps, you can walk around, uh, you do not need to be on bed rest. In fact, we don't want you to be on bed rest. Um, but I see things like, you know, no bungee jumping, helicopter skiing, uh, extreme snowboarding, alligator wrestling, cage fighting, uh, mountain uh, scaling rocks down the side of the mountain. Um, those kinds of things just uh, hold off on. Um, you can resume skydiving in three days. How about that? Um, other than that, follow along doing what you're supposed to do. Five supplements associated with successful embryo transfer. Prenatal vitamin, CoQ10, vitamin D, vitamin E, and L-arginine. I would recommend anybody doing an embryo transfer be on those supplements. Uh, Lady Jamello says, should I be on Prograph? I'm a level one uh, I took it for fresh transfer. I also have two embryos left. Is it a good idea to thaw and let them go to day five? Um, I would say, uh, so first of all, a program is part of our, our level three uh, protocol. Um, and there are some situations where we may think level three is going to be the best choice for you. Um, if, um, 
you just did a fresh transfer and that wasn't successful. I wouldn't say by necessity, you know, that doesn't meet criteria for recurring implantation failure. Um, a, a day three transfer is always going to be less successful than, I'm sorry, a fresh transfer is always going to be less successful than a frozen transfer because your body's been in egg making mode. And so that can alter some of the chemistry there. And if it was a day three transfer, day threes are always going to be less effective, uh, less successful rather uh, than a blastocyst. So um, prograft may be helpful for you at a lower dose. It doesn't sound like it harms anything and it may be useful, but I don't think you need the 1.5 um, uh, twice a day. Our, our standard dose in immune protocol three is a 0 0.5 twice a day. So it's one milligram total. And, you know, I think that's not going to be harmful uh, really for anybody. Um, and should I thaw my day three embryos and grow them to day five? No, I wouldn't do that. Now, let's say, uh, and this is to Lady J, Lady Jamello, let's say that you did two or three more retrievals. Let's say that you did more retrievals and now you went from, you got two embryos in the first one, and then you've got four embryos from the second one, and then you've got five embryos from the third. Well, now suddenly you've got five and four is nine, 10, 11. You've got 11 embryos. And 11 is a lot of transfers potentially to have to do in order to get to the ones that are going to be normal. So in that scenario, you might say, hey, now I got this whole big bunch of day three embryos. Maybe I want to thaw them and grow out to blast to let nature help me to select which of the embryos have a higher probability of pregnancy. So, but in the circumstance that you're describing there, uh, no, <clears throat> I think I, I probably would not recommend it. Okay. Mawash says in my first retrieval, I had 15 follicles, but got only four and immature. Again, today I had eight, but got only four. Why is it like that? Well, so um, some of that may have to do um, with the, let's see, there's another message here. I was unable to make blast in my first retrieval. Should I push embryos to blast in the second or freeze at day three? I am diminished ovarian reserve and 39. Um, again, as far as when to freeze, if, if you've got four or fewer embryos, our recommendation is that you freeze them on day three. Um, because, uh, again, much rather see that embryo going inside of you than potentially dying off in the lab. It may grow in you when it didn't grow in the lab. So if there's four or few, fewer, I would say freeze them at day three. No hard, there's no bad thing about having a day three embryo. Um, now, why you respond differently in the two cycles and, uh, you know, there are different things that are involved in there. First, uh, you had 15 follicles, but only got only four eggs uh, and they were immature. So this may be, you know, it has to do with, well, kind of when you trigger. Um, it may have to do with how you were stemmed. That may be a little higher dose. We might drop the dose there, try to go out a little bit longer. I would go for less quantity and more quality. That, to me, seems like the best idea. Uh, let's see. Uh, Cindy says, partner with low morphology and motility. Are the chances high of fertilizing an egg? The answer to that is yes. Because uh, one uh, sperm is all that we need for one egg. And uh, these folks um, sit around, look under microscopes all day long and look at sperm to determine, well, which sperm it looks good. So even if there's one, uh, you know, the odds are that there's going to be something in there that is normal morphology. And even, even if the semen analysis showed 0% normal forms, there's always going to be something in there that's normal when they look long enough. And they take that one sperm and put it in the one egg. So, yep, Cindy, I think you have very, very high probability of fertilizing egg. And that's one of the reasons that you would choose to do IVF in general. Um, odds are much better of fertilizing in that scenario uh, with IVF than they are with any, any other modality. Um, how important is the uh, TH1, TH2 blood test for pregnancy after an embryo transfer? I would not recommend the blood test. The blood test uh, is about $1,200 and it's not easily accessible and 
Uh, people don't know how to order it correctly because we don't routinely do it. It would be much better to, uh, to treat that empirically. Um, and if there is a history of such, you know, kind of pregnancy problems um, going on, then I'd say, um, you know, it might be worth um, um, staying on the medication after transfer. Well, actually, I, I would say probably don't even need to stop until you're at least 12 weeks uh, of pregnancy, uh, maybe even longer just kind of depending. Uh, back over to Facebook, Chloe says, found out I am pregnant two weeks after retrieval. Uh, I'm worried because I was sedated. Um, what are your thoughts? Um, there are many um, jokes I could make about that, about uh, you being sedated when you got pregnant, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's funny. I've had, I've had, um, three people now in the last uh, few days who have done um, IVF, have done a retrieval, haven't yet done a transfer, then in fact didn't get their period and did a pregnancy test and found out that they're positive. Um, and maybe some of these folks have been trying for, you know, um, five years, 10 years, never got pregnant before, did a round of IVF, made some embryos, um, but then uh, got pregnant from spontaneous intercourse, usually within a couple of days uh, around the time of the trigger. Remember, sperm lives in the vagina for five days. And so um, even though we're giving you a trigger shot and we're retrieving the eggs from the ovaries, there is very probably some egg that's hanging out in there um, that may get released on its own from some little follicle, from something there. Um, there's a good chance that sperm can meet egg in that normal fashion. And then people get pregnant. Um, the thing I just want to know for sure is that your progesterone level is normal. Progesterone is the most important hormone to kind of help maintain the pregnancy. I'd want to check on that, but I would not worry about the sedation part. Um, you don't have any higher risk of a birth defect or anything bad happening as a result of the IVF uh, procedure, um, uh, the egg retrieval or your recovery or anything else. So congratulations. I mean, if you, you could have just, you know, Chloe done that um, before you did IVF, that, that would have saved a lot of trouble, don't you think? Um, no, you didn't ask my opinion, but now you know, that's just kind of what I think about it. But congratulations. Now you should be um, fine in that regard. God bless. That's, uh, that's really great news. Um, however, it has to work, right? You know, uh, Maria, uh, I'm 33. My consultation is on the 9th. What do I prepare? So before your consultation, if you've had treatments before, we want to know what they are. If you've had blood tests, we'd like you to upload all of them to your portal so that we have them, so that we can look at them at the time. It becomes very frustrating when we have an initial consult and, uh, and people are like, oh yeah, I, I had that done a few months ago, but I, I don't know the results. Well, um, maybe I can look them up. Can you hold on for a little while? Well, we've got pretty limited time in those consults. So the more efficient we can be during them, the better off we are. If you've got the blood test, please upload them so that we can look at them um, at the time of the consult. Look forward to talking to you. Hi to Lindsay. So unfortunately, my transfer ended in an early miscarriage. Oh, I am so sorry to hear that. Um, I did a natural FET. Would you recommend adding PIO or more progesterone pills? I was only on two progesterone vaginally every day. Most of the time, a miscarriage is going to occur due to an embryo issue. It is most commonly due to the embryo, not to anything hormonal or anything otherwise related to Lindsay and Lindsay's uterus. All right. So, um, or um, I'm talking to you, Lindsay, but obviously we're talking to everybody. Usually it's a, it's a genetic issue or a biochemical issue in the embryo, uh, especially with a first miscarriage. So I'm so sorry to hear that. It's a, it's a crappy thing to have to go through, but the silver lining there is that uterus uh, brain was talking uterus was listening you were able to implant a pregnancy and that pregnancy was able to start to grow so we know that something is in fact working right that's a plus that's a good thing um we test your 
um, progesterone level. So as long as your progesterone level was, was normal uh, and in a natural cycle, we look for that progesterone to be a 10 or above, um, then there would be no indication to adding progesterone in oil. Um, zero. Uh, and if you're going to do progesterone in oil, you just do a medicated cycle. I don't see any advantage to doing a natural cycle and using PIO, um, in my, uh, in my opinion. Um, but we test it in a medicated cycle, the progesterone uh, should be at a 20 and in a, in a, in a natural cycle, that progesterone, we want to be at a 10. So Lindsay, as long as we tested it, no, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't add anything else. The, uh, the vaginal progesterone we use uh, in the natural cycle is really just, uh, it's as a local effect. So it's not going to reflect anything in the blood test. The blood test will come from 100% from either the progesterone that your ovary is making, or if you're doing a medicated cycle, the progesterone uh, that we are giving you through the form of the shot. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, looks like uh, Linda when Linda uh, Win Trank says, thoughts about doing an HCG wash and or boosters after two failed implantations. So HCG boosters are helpful and beneficial in a natural cycle. They really don't do much of anything in a medicated cycle. So I don't recommend them in that regard. I do think an HCG wash is a useful thing to do. Yes, indeed I do. Uh, Georgia Sun said, I would like to do something that involves DHEA. Does CNY have any experience using this along with other meds? Uh, for the 40 plus club. So the recommendation for DHEA is 25 milligrams three times a day for egg quality. And this is really just for folks who are over 40 or for women who have an AMH of less than one. DHEA is three times a day. Uh, we can then check a level and sometimes we'll adjust it uh, based on that. And that's a part of the evidence-based protocol for egg quality. Uh, Ms. Perfect says, I had a negative uh, pregnancy test with a 6BB embryo. How long should I wait to try again? As soon as you get your period, my friend, you can go back to do, you can do another transfer. Um, there is no evidence that says that you need to wait. Um, your body will be ready and willing and able to get pregnant. So bring it on, right? Uh, Nikita says, how soon after the consultation can you start IVF? We talked about that before. Usually in the very next month, Melissa asks, is a saline sonogram necessary? Um, depending on what you're doing, um, I feel very strongly that a saline sono uh, is, is a, an extremely important part of your evaluation um, because you're investing a lot, you know, to make an embryo. We want to know for sure that there is no scar tissue, there's no polyps, there's no bands of muscle, there's no um, um, balls of muscle on the inside that may inhibit one of your beautiful, perfect embryos from being able to implant. The saline sauna or a hysteroscopy will show us that. So I generally recommend that that cavity be evaluated once a year. To me, that's a deal breaker. I don't think you should be doing anything with your uterus unless in the past year we have confirmed that the inside is normal. My two cents worth, which are worth exactly two cents. Uh, what are the recommendations comes from Brooker Johnson for transferring a low level mosaic if it's the last embryo? It's a good embryo. Uh, Brooker, you, um, um, a, a mosaic embryo has a slightly lower chance of implanting. So your euploid embryo gives you 65%. Your untested blast gives you about 30%. Your uh, mosaic embryo gives you about a 40% chance of implantation. So it's better than an untested embryo, but not quite as good as a blast. If it sticks, it has just as high probability of giving you a normal baby as does your euploid embryo. It has a slightly higher risk for miscarriage, uh, but 100% um, it is not a throwaway embryo. I could also introduce you to, I can think off the top of my head, a dozen people uh, who had mosaic embryos that now have beautiful, perfect, normal babies. So fingers crossed. Um, Katie says, getting surgery to remove my fallopian tube in two weeks. 
hoping to set up a consult and see what options we have. We will look forward to that. Let's see if we can get a last couple of questions in here. Um, let's see, is it okay to skip prednisone? For IVF, the answer is yes. I feel like prednisone is uh, is a more uh, important thing in a in an embryo transfer than it is for IVF. Um, but there are many practices that don't use uh, prednisone at all. Some people don't feel well on prednisone, don't want to use it. So for the general public, the general population, um, it too is not a deal breaker. Uh, Liz Fisher says, "Are the immune supplements?" Um, or meds prescribed to everyone, or do we need to talk about it at an appointment? Just about everybody gets, some, or really everybody gets some form of immune protocol. So um, um, everybody should be included in that. But when you have your consult, if you're curious, ask about it. It should be mentioned to you, but sometimes we get so sidetracked talking about meds and process and all the other things that we may end up um forgetting to talk about it. So that's one of the reasons that after I do a consult, I send a little email and it's got some stuff uh, in there most of the time. Um, last question here, Neri says, uh, my blood count and hemoglobin came back low as if I'm currently anemic because this have caused, uh, been caused by my egg retrieval a few months ago. And so I still move forward with a fresh transfer with a, oh, with a frozen transfer. So, um, Really, honestly, that anemia ought to be fixed. You, you should try to correct that. Usually you can correct that with, uh, with by taking some iron uh, pills. Um, if it's real significant anemia, that's not normal. Um, and, um, and could it have been caused from a retrieval a few months ago? Probably not. There's really not, in most cases, real significant blood loss associated with an egg retrieval. And certainly from a few months ago, that should have uh, equilibrated itself out by now. So iron pills is the way to go with that. Hey, remember Linktree slash Randy Fink MD. Um, it's L I N K T R dot E E, or through my Instagram, which is Randy Fink MD. It's the link on my Instagram page. You'll see the book I wrote that's called Vitamin Victory um, the, uh, the uh, Natural Steps Towards uh, Achieving uh, Pregnancy Outcomes that we're all looking for. What can a handful of vitamins do for you? That's the evidence based protocol and a wonderful audio book. Uh, I think is, uh, I'm, I'm so happy with the audio. I'm happy with both those things and I hope you'll avail yourself of them. But we're out of time for today, which means we'll be back next week. My favorite place to be on a Tuesday afternoon. And I hope it is yours too. Every single day we can make a difference in this world. And God knows this world could use some difference. Every step forward, make it with kindness, make it with love and know that each day, is full of hope for a new tomorrow because tomorrow brings a whole new sunrise. This whole fertility business is not your novel. It's not your book. It ain't the magazine that you're featured in. It is merely a chapter. And what are we doing here? We're trying to rewrite that chapter and we're doing it together. So until next week, thanks so much for being here. God bless everyone and good night.